I think we can begin our short transatlantic conversation. I would like to welcome to the floor our second discutant, our guest, Radosław Sikorski, who is the member of European Parliament, also just recently elected, congratulations, but also for a number of years, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, one of the longest serving ministers since 1989. It's great to have you, gentlemen. Congressman, let me start, excuse me, let me start uh, from saying thank you for this uh, great speech. You have reassured and I think you have addressed the many questions that were already here at the audience. So the question of commitment of the current administration, maybe even more precisely the commitment of Donald Trump to the alliance. And what I understand you're saying is let's see what America does, not what the president says. Do you really think that's the case? Well, absolutely I do. Uh, you can listen to the talk, but you should also be aware of the walk. Mm -hmm. America's commitment is seen in money. It is seen in personnel here in Poland. We, are in, we have some four, over 4,000 American troops here, and we will add another 1,000 to that in the uh, near future. Our commitment across Europe is absolutely clear. Uh, and there's a lot of money involved here, and the U.S. Congress has appropriated the money to support NATO. So the talk is one thing, but the actual walk, what is actually being done is where the fact of the matter is found, and that is we support NATO both physically as well as monetarily. So you're not worried about U.S. commitment to the alliance. Is there anything else that worries you in our alliance, not only within NATO, but our partnership between Europe and the United States? Well, the partnership has been for many, many years. It actually existed before there was NATO. Uh, over the years, the United States has been deeply involved in Europe in a very positive way uh, through wars of, uh, and through economic activities. But in every relationship, there are days when you disagree. Mm -hmm. Now, my wife and I have been married 53 years, and there has never been a day of disagreement. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> but we, we work our way through that, and uh, the alliance will be the same way. Excellent. Thank you very much. Minister, uh, you're a, a good friend uh, of and very well acquainted of the United States. You travel, you lived uh, back and forth here in Europe and the United States. Is there anything that worries you uh, about the state of our current relations? Is it all so well? Well, first of all, uh, let me... First of all, let me thank the American delegation for being here and for your uh, kind words. And it's true that uh, for the last 30 years, there's been a consen bipartisan consensus uh, on uh, friendship with Poland and of uh, support for the alliance. And good things have happened under administrations from both parties. Mm -hmm. I signed the uh, missile uh, defense agreement with the uh, Bush administration, but it was under President Obama that uh, contingency plans were written for the uh, defense uh, of our part of the country, of, the, of Europe, and, um, and the rotational presence uh, also started with the um, Wales-NATO summit. Um, but you asked before the conference to say what keeps us uh, awake at night, and, and yes, Congress can do many good things, but uh, what uh, the military people in this room and former ministers think uh, about a, um, a, a catastrophic uh, threat to Poland's security is what the Russian Federation exercises. Mm -hmm. And what they exercise is um, interference uh, uh, under the pretext of defending national minorities, either in the Baltic states mm -hmm. or in Poland and they exercise first use of nuclear weapons on the battlefield right away. And if they were to do that, the only person in the world who can respond, who can match them uh, in entering on the ladder of nuclear escalation is the President of the United States, he personally. And we just hope that he would do better than he did at the uh, press conference with President Putin in Helsinki. Congressman, will he do better? Uh, your dismay uh, at that pre about that press conference was matched by most Americans. Uh, we understand your concerns and we share those concerns. The reality is that we should never come to the question of the deployment and the use of nuclear weapons. And that's what this alliance is all about. This is alliance is about a strong deterrence, a real deterrence, one that is both military as well as uh, 
uh, economic strength and also the strength of values. So this conference and what I've seen from the many participants and speeches and other uh, activities here and in other meetings is that there is a determination among the NATO allies to have a, a deterrence. So that should Russia decide to engage in a belligerent action, perhaps as a result of uh, att attempting or uh, with Russian citizens or Russian speaking people that may be in the various countries, they should know before they even consider, don't mess with NATO. Uh, does it go to a nuclear issue? We talk about that all the time and we make it very clear. And uh, yes, the president has the, the button to be sure, but you never want to get there. And you want to make it absolutely clear that don't even think about a nuclear war. You think about a nuclear war, you think about the end of everything. Every but, that's, but that's exactly what worries me. The Russians exercise it and they talk about it. We don't. We would be so shocked by such a uh, Russian move that we wouldn't know what to do in the first week and they will have achieved their political aims. And Minister Shikorsky is not I only excluding that's... this, he cannot sleep at night because of this. Well, I try to understand your view here on the border of Russia. And that's not so different because we also border Russia in a different way. We've been for what, 60, 70 years now dealing with the nuclear, the reality of nuclear war. Uh, my concern here is for the next 15 months. I believe we'll have a new president. And I believe many of the concerns that we have with the uncertainty about American policy will uh, pass on and we'll go back to the more traditional relationship that we've had. The clarity of purpose is critically important here. And the clarity is don't even think about using a nuclear weapon because that is, starts down a path for which the end is the elimination of, of our earth as we know it. Don't start that. The second thing that is critically important is that we are now engaged in a new nuclear arms race. Russia, China, and the United States are all repurposing, rebuilding, rearming, and creating new delivery systems that are extraordinarily dangerous because they are stealthy. They are designed not to be observed, not to be seen. And that sets off a completely different uh, circumstance and situation for the way in which we dealt with um, deterrence in the past. This is of great concern to me and to many others, and it's something that we ought to be aware of as mm -hmm. a world community. My concern here is that we do not engage now in any meaningful negotiations with either China or Russia about this buildup of nuclear arms. Mm -hmm. Now, it's more than what you talked about, some sort of a conflict and a war that might go nuclear. It is the overarching problem of a new nuclear arms race. And we have got to engage in a discussion to rein this arms race and bring it under control. Otherwise, we're going to see the nuclear weapons proliferate. Mm -hmm. We're going to see delivery systems um, in place that are designed not to be observed. Congressman, um, if I may, if we're talking about nuclear de deterrence, I wanted to start maybe with Minister Sikorsky asking about Iran. It's clear we agree on the question of Russia. It's unclear about the differences on policy on China. We can talk about this in a moment. But what about Iran? There is a clear differentiation of the policy of this administration and the previous administration. The European Union has backed the previous administration very much uh, in regard to the agreement that we currently still have as Europeans with Iran. So, so Minister Sikorsky, what do you think? Do, can we find an agreement here? Do you, see, do, do you see this area that is critical for uh, transatlantic relations uh, to be resolved, for us to speak with one voice? It's actually the second uh, most urgent thing that keeps me awake at night because I think we are in a very dangerous phase mm -hmm. in our relations with Iran. Foreign policy is a series of bets. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and some you win, some you lose. The previous administration bet that if we defang the nuclear issue, we give ourselves 10 years and maybe something will happen in Iran, the, the regime might mellow or become something different. Uh, the current administration is betting that if we squeeze them hard enough, maybe the regime will fall. What would you be betting? And what I'm, what I'm worried about is that our sanctions may be working a little too well, and the regime is becoming desperate. And desperate regimes do desperate things. Uh, when you think that you're about to fall, you roll the dice, which is what the Japanese did in 1941. And th the pattern of Iranian attacks, uh, first uh, at the Anchorage, at the Anchorage mm -hmm. tankers, uh, and now at Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Arabia, they're not trying mm -hmm. to hide who did it. Mm -hmm. So I think the United States is being provoked. Mm -hmm. I think they've just worked out that in order to provoke an American attack, you need to kill some Americans. Um, and that's what I'm worried about, because we've done wars in the Middle East before, and I don't like the consequences. But do you agree with the current stance of the European Union that is trying to defend uh, the agreement uh, that we have currently with Iran? I think the agreement is dead, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, America has successfully persuaded Europe that you have to choose between trading with Iran or mm -hmm. trading with the United States. That's an easy choice to make. The Iranians were hoping that somehow there'll be a bypass mm -hmm. uh, of American sanction. That hasn't happened. So they no longer have any incentive to abide by GCPOA. Therefore, it's dead. Mm -hmm. And Congressman, do you, do you agree with the current uh, policy of the administration? And do you think that the current attacks in Saudi Arabia might have changed also the view of some of the people in the Democratic Party on, on how uh, the, the relations with Iran should be handled? Uh, if I might back up a little bit, mm -hmm. the JCPOA, uh, the president's decision to pull out of the JCPOA was a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're dealing with the reality of the effects of that decision, and you explained it so very, very well. And I, I would just, if I would, I'd echo most everything you said. Um, the question is, where do we go from here? Uh, I believe things are going to change in, within 14, 15 months. Uh, I believe we'll have a new uh, president and a different way of approaching these issues. Uh, what will that be? Are we going back to the... We're not going to be able to go back to where we were. Unfortunately, we are where we are today, and for the near term, mm -hmm. we have to be very, very careful not to take the bait, not to, uh, uh, to act precipitously, uh, there may very well be some incident, uh, but we have to be very careful about this. Uh, I don't think it is in anybody's interest to have a significant or any war in the Middle East, and we could, uh, as you described, the uh, potential for that. So this is a time to be very measured, to be very uh, clear. Uh, the sanctions are in place. The uh, administration calls it uh, maximum pressure, uh, laid out 12 uh, uh, the criteria for a solution, and that's not going to happen. Uh, so we will move carefully. We'll try as best we can to uh, pull our allies back together and to think about the next step. Uh, and I think there is a possibility, a, a different agreement, uh, and I think that's possible. Yeah. Thank you. Last, uh, last question, last huge issue, China. We have seen what has happened in Hong Kong uh, for many, many weeks, if not months. We are hoping that these protests will remain peaceful. It seems there is a specific uh, escalation of, of the situation in Hong Kong. But also for a few years now, we're seeing a change in Chinese foreign policy, its posture. Uh, what do you think, uh, us as a transatlantic alliance, what kind of stance should we have towards China? Do you see challenges for solidarity on our side uh, if, if the situation indeed uh, escalates. Pani Ministra. Well, we are a North Atlantic uh, treaty alliance. We are by treaty obliged to help each other in the North Atlantic area. Mm -hmm. uh, China is not covered. Uh, my colleague uh, Graham Allison from Harvard uh, has written a book that I recommend to everyone that uh, is this trap. I'm worried that you will mismanage the rise of China. Uh, and that your trade war with China will uh, go worse. And I'm also worried that you no longer have the military superiority that you think you have. Uh, 
you have an overall superiority, but not necessarily in China's immediate neighborhood. Um, and China is, uh, uh, has a sense of itself as a great power and thinks it's coming back to its natural place, which is to, to have a, a string of vassal states around it and is building its capacity to deny you the area around uh, in the South China Sea and Taiwan. And, and I think they'll succeed uh, because the logistics work in their favor. Uh, uh, for you, it's on the other side of the ocean. For them, it's right next door. And therefore, how gracefully you will adjust to that new reality uh, will perhaps decide the future of the world in the 21st century. Because if you mismanage it and you have a war with China there, of course, you will throw all your resources to that and we will suffer the consequences. Congressman. No one is looking forward to a war with China or a war with Russia or a war at all. And so your task and my task, the, war, the task of all of us, is to find ways to uh, address the realities of competition, uh, economic competition to be sure. Uh, those of us in America that have observed this believe that China is grossly unfair, uh, quite happy to steal intellectual property and to use it to their advantage and to use their economic power to their advantage, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Huawei, all concerns to all of us. Uh, those are very real concerns. We need to manage our way through that. But also we need to understand that a war, and we're quite confident that it would be a horrible war. And we would win to the detriment of the entire world, to ourselves as well as China. And I think China understands that also. And certainly Russia needs to understand that. So how do we avoid that? We avoid that by engagement. We avoid that by not a trade war, but by a very clear understanding, in this case of China, no, you're not going to steal prop intellectual property. No, you're not going to use your uh, technology to, as a method of spying on everybody. Uh, we recognize the economic power you have, but so, does, so do all of us collectively and individually. So that's a management issue over time. Uh, one of the things that I think all of us are discovering is that the president was wrong. It's easy to start a war and it's easy to end a trade war. No, it's not so easy to end a trade war. So we've got to manage our way through that, recognizing that there are principles that we must um, succeed. And that has to do with a reasonable trade program in which the uh, the, the Chinese activities of the last two decades, three decades, can no longer continue. And so that's uh, part of our work. It's certainly an issue for the United States and an equally big issue for Europe, mm -hmm. the European Union, and the countries of Europe. I just wanted to say uh, that concerning trade, the WTO has just approved American trade sanctions on the European Union, on the EU. Uh, so uh, that is probably one of the, the huge issues that we're going to have to face in our bilateral relations. Uh, do you, Congressman, in any way would like to comment that? Is that the way well, forward in our relationship? I, I walked in here, I had a uh, conversation as I walked in with uh, one of the delegates of one of the European countries and discovered that we now have a trade war with Europe. Exactly. It uh, just started yesterday. Uh, the WTO program and, and the apparently some seven billion dollar uh, mm -hmm. fine uh, is in play. Do I understand all of that? No, just a discussion quickly this morning. Uh, I was also told that uh, Europe is also putting forth its own argument that the United States has cheated. Of course, that's not true. Um, <laughs> however, the WTO will work that out. The challenge for America and for the European Union is to work our way through these issues. Uh, let us assume the WTO uh, decision is correct, that there was uh, inappropriate subsidization of uh, Airbus. Mm -hmm. uh, and the argument on the other side coming back is, well, so too with Boeing. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be worked out maybe We'll both say, well, everybody's cheated, so uh, let's get on with life. Do you think, Minister, that will impact our relations in the weeks to come, the question of trade? Well, I, I think um, uh, 
it's a question of statesmanship because we know that a similar judgment at WTO is coming up as regards American subsidies for Boeing. Mm -hmm. And it's likely to be a very similar judgment. Mm -hmm. So the choice is, do we uh, take advantage of a temporary uh, uh, right to do something that will hurt the relationship? Or do we wait and try to square it in some way? And I, I hope we can find a way of, uh, uh, of, um, of finding a, sol a solution that would not damage trade between us any further. So you think it's more technicalities at the end of the day than really uh, straining our alliance? If I might just add here that the global trade is absolutely essential to the health of all of our economies. Uh, any, all of our economies, if we were to somehow reduce or eliminate the global trade programs that exist, we would all be harmed. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we do this in a way that is reasonable? Uh, fairness is in the eye of the individual. And so fairness to us would be advantageous to us and detrimental to you. So th we have to work our way through this, uh, through mm -hmm. time. Minister, last word. There is a problem with globalization. It benefits poor people in poor countries and rich people and rich companies in rich countries. And we need to redistribute the benefits to the people that need them, but trade wars are not the, uh, the way to do it. So, so what I, I agree. Excellent. We agreed also on this. What I do propose is this topic we're going to take care of next Warsaw Security Forum uh, and try to make global, globalization fairer for people and square. But for now, I have to thank you, gentlemen, for a wonderful conversation. Let's give them a great thank round you. of applause. <laughs>